Hi guys, welcome back to Book Odyssey for the second part in this two-part series on futurism in science fiction. In the first video we looked at the technological predictions made by sci-fi writers that came true. In this video we're going to look at the predictions that became reality or society. I've delved into sociology and science fiction a few times on my channel and why this aspect of sci-fi is not only fascinating but also important to the genre as a whole. I do a deep dive into sociology and science fiction in my video here, so don't forget to check that out. Societal predictions in science fiction can be fascinatingly diverse, and sometimes the dominant focus of the story centers entirely around this social aspect, such as with dystopian and utopian fiction. Although I should say these are often less predictions than they are warnings or aspirations. Often changes in society are spurred by technology, and sometimes it's vice versa, where a change in society has prompted a need for technological advancement. We can see this most recently during the COVID-19 pandemic, and how, when the whole world went into lockdown, we turned to technology as a method to keep us connected. You could argue this has driven a digital revolution one step further, with remote and home working being now very much the norm. Whatever the situation, technology and societal change go hand in hand. In fact, seminal cyberpunk writer William Gibson, who is credited for predicting the internet, said he believes all cultural change is fundamentally technologically driven. We covered a lot of technological changes in part one of this video, so if you haven't watched that, I'd suggest you start there and come back to this one. So let's start this journey with one giant leap. Trying to predict the future is a discouraging and hazardous occupation. The United States Apollo 11 was the first crewed mission to land on the moon in 1969. There were six crewed US landings between 69 and 72 and numerous uncrewed landings. It was certainly one giant leap for mankind and was a scientific and engineering feat, the likes of which we arguably haven't seen since. Science fiction novel by Jules Verne, From the Earth to the Moon, published in 1865, astoundingly predicted many aspects of the 69 manned lunar landing of Apollo 11. Verne's astronauts were launched from a Florida site in an aluminium capsule, and in the book he even gave accurate calculations as to the amount of force that would be needed to propel the rocket out of Earth's atmosphere. The three men in Verne's novel, however, never actually stepped foot on the moon. NASA has acknowledged other similarities between Apollo 11 and Verne's novel as well. For example, the space agency said the shape and size of Verne's fictional vessel closely resembled the Apollo spacecraft. This hasn't been the only space-related prediction made by writers. In fact, in Jonathan Swift's 1926 satire, Gulliver's Travels, he wrote that the Laputans found two moons with relatively short orbital periods around Mars, 150 years before two such moons were discovered. It wasn't just the existence of the moons that Swift got right. According to the Journal of History of Ideas, the moons, quote, strange behavior agreed very closely with Swift's description. The moons, named Phobos and Deimos, are odd because we don't know where the moons came from. They look like asteroids foreign to the red planet, but behave like byproducts of Mars' early impact laden history. Several craters on Mars' moons Phobos are now named after Swift's characters. In the first part of this Futurism in Sci Fi series, we looked at how British science fiction author and futurist Arthur C. Clarke predicted satellites in geosynchronous orbit of Earth being used for telecommunication relays and for television signals. Not only was this accurate, but it also led to the term Clarke orbit being used for when an orbiting object is stationary over a point on the equator of a rotating object. This wasn't the only accurate prediction Clarke made for humanity's adventures into space. In his novel 2001 A Space Odyssey, he correctly predicted the gravity assist manoeuvre, with the Discovery spaceship using Jupiter's gravity to speed itself up on the way to Saturn. This idea of using planets to assist in slinging a spacecraft was actually used by many NASA probes, including the Marina 10 and Voyager probes. We're aware of the scale of the planet so we don't accept that our own circumscribed horizons constitute reality. Much more real is what is relayed to us by the TV. It's the culture of people's daily lives that can often seem most alien when it comes to societies in science fiction. This could affect anything from the type of food people eat, how they have relationships, if they have them at all, what their homes are like, what they do for entertainment. 
Imagine the horror of the Victorians facing concepts like Tinder. <laughs> Actually, that would be pretty funny. <laughs> Sci-fi novel by Jules Verne, Paris in the 20th century, written in 1860, but first published in 1994 follows a young man who struggles unsuccessfully to live in a technologically advanced world he considers culturally backwards. <laughs> Sorry, I'm thinking about what Victorians would be like on Tinder. <laughs> oh, is that an ankle? <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. The story paints a dystopian view of a technological future civilization. However, many of Verne's predictions were pretty accurate. Ironically, Verne's publisher would not release the book because he thought it would be too unbelievable. Verne's portrait of 1960s Paris features gasoline-powered cars, weapons of mass destruction, electronic music, the electric chair, climate change caused displacement, and quote, cynical, hardened, career-minded, and distinctly masculine women in their dress and manner. Another book considered ahead of its time with its predictions, specifically regarding societal violence and what some might call hookup culture, is John Brunner's Stand on Zanzibar. Published in 1969, this story, set in 2010, reveals a world where America is plagued by random acts of violence, such as school shootings and terrorist attacks. In the story, cars are powered by rechargeable electric fuel cells, and men and women shun marriage for short-term, low-commitment hookups. In the story, shooting sprees are a regular occurrence, especially in American high schools, before the perpetrator turns the gun on themselves. Terrorism has also become a major concern in the US with several terrorist attacks having been carried out on American buildings. In Brunner's novel, the US also contends with overpopulation and widening social divides. It predicts the decriminalization of marijuana, the euro currency, the decline of popularity in tobacco, global news channels, Viagra, and the legalization of same-sex marriage. English novelist J.G. Ballard, author of such works as Empire of the Sun, High Rise and The Drowned World, wrote an essay in 1977 that turned out to be surprisingly prophetic, especially with regard to social networks. He wrote, Each of our actions during the day, throughout the entire spectrum of everyday life, will be instantly recorded on video. At night, we will sit down to see the images selected by a trained computer to choose just our best profiles, our most intelligent dialogues, our most affectionate expressions captured through the friendliest filters. And then we will gather all this to have an improved reconstruction of our day. What he's saying here is very close to what we might call social media's power of illusion when representing reality as it actually is, rather than the perfect version presented to us. Then in a 1987 interview, Ballard also spoke about what seems to be prophecy with regard to reality TV and the rise of social media influencers. He said, Every home will be transformed into its own TV studio. We'll all be simultaneously actor, director and screenwriter in our own soap opera. People will start screening themselves. They will become their own TV programs. This theme of streams of interconnected information can also be seen in the 2002 novel Feeds by M.T. Anderson. In this young adult dystopian novel, people access information through connections implanted directly into their brains. While our technology hasn't quite progressed that far, Anderson's future posited that these feeds would give people constant access to information and the ability to stay connected at the price of being constantly bombarded by advertising tailored to their preferences by data mining corporations. Facebook and Twitter haven't directly implanted themselves into our brains yet, but smartphone addiction is apparently now a thing. According to King's College London researchers, more than one in three young adults report symptoms of smartphone addiction. However, the supposed condition is not recognized by any global health body. Nomophobia, which stands for no mobile phone phobia, is used to describe a psychological condition when people have a fear of being detached from mobile phone connectivity, according to the Recovery Trust in the UK. Then in Ray Bradbury's classic dystopian story Fahrenheit 451, published in 1953, the novel describes people communicating with friends through a digital wall, which bears some similarity to the sharing of messages on platforms like Facebook. How we consume information is also highlighted in Jules Verne's 1889 short story called In the Year 2889. 
While he may have been a little off on the date, Verne predicted that people would one day listen to news instead of reading the newspaper. He writes, Instead of being printed, the Earth Chronicle is every morning spoken to subscribers who from interesting conversations with reporters, statesmen and scientists learn the news of the day. Not only is how we consume information prime subject for the futurist sci-fi writer, but the very information we consume is too. While not a direct prediction in itself, but I thought it worth mentioning, is the parallel between Isaac Asimov's Encyclopedia Galactica in his Foundation trilogy, published in 1951, and Wikipedia, a free online encyclopedia created and edited by volunteers around the world and hosted by Wikimedia Foundation. Asimov describes the Encyclopedia Galactica as a giant summary of all knowledge, compiled by thousands of researchers. On money, Edward Bellamy wrote in 1888 in his novel Looking Backward about the concept of a universal credit where citizens in his future utopia carry a card that allows them to spend on goods and services without paper money changing hands. On religion, you may or may not know that Scientology was founded by the science fiction writer L. Ron Hubbard, and that Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land also spawned its own religion, which I go into in depth in my video here. The Church of Scientology, according to the church itself, offers a path leading to a complete and certain understanding of one's true spiritual nature and one's relationship to self, family, groups, mankind, all life forms, the material universe and the spiritual universe and the supreme being, whatever that is. There are reportedly 10 million church members worldwide. The point of creating futures is to get people to imagine what they want and what they don't want to happen down the road and maybe do something about it. Modern civil rights protections were predicted in the book Woman on the Edge of Time by Marge Piercy published in 1976. The novel, which is considered a classic of utopian speculative fiction, predicts civil rights protections for LGBT people and anticipates the 2010 US Supreme Court ruling Citizens United, which some argue gave corporations and super political action committees unprecedented influence over elections. The book also predicts the popularity of cosmetic procedures like lip fillers and foreshadows huge political changes including the increased influence of corporations on politics. None other than H.G. Wells, in his many utopias, envisioned a government ruling nation states which would give every person the right to be educated, have work and the freedom to enjoy their personal life with privacy. Wells visualised freedom from any sort of mutilation or sterilisation and from torture. There are admittedly varying degrees of these rights seen across the globe today and can be largely summarised as universal human rights. On the dystopian flip side, in 1949 British author George Orwell wrote the classic 1984. The primary theme of the book is to warn readers of the dangers of totalitarianism. The central focus is to convey the extreme level of control and power possible under a truly totalitarian regime. It explores how such a governmental system would impact society and the people who live in it. In the story, he describes the concept of a dystopian state monitored by an interconnected web of security cameras so that personal privacy has been all but obliterated. According to 2021 research by Tooltester, China has more CCTV than anywhere else in the world, with over one camera for every citizen in its major cities. It's almost impossible to go unnoticed there. Perhaps more surprisingly, according to the research, is that the US comes in second and has an average of two cameras for every 10 people in its major cities. The UK claimed third place, with one CCTV camera for every 16 citizens in larger cities. Nothing remains the same from one moment to the next. You can't step into the same river twice. Life, evolution, the whole universe of space-time, matter, energy, existence itself is essentially change. The environment is always in the news in some form, and it has been for at least as long as I can remember, with climate change currently at the top of the agenda. Growing environmental concern is often reflected in science fiction. In Ursula Le Guin's 1971 novel The Lathe of Heaven, when an unethical psychotherapist learns that his patient's dreams can alter reality, he manipulates those dreams for his own ends. 
The story set in 2002 is set on an earth where the polar ice caps are melting, temperatures are rising due to greenhouse gases, and there's a long war in the Middle East. This book is among the earliest published that reference global warming. According to NASA, while Earth's climate has changed throughout its history, the current warming is happening at a rate not seen in the past 10,000 years. It says, The current warming trend is different because it is clearly the result of human activities since the mid-1800s and is proceeding at a rate not seen over many recent millennia. Overpopulation is another popular environmental theme among sci-fi writers. Make Room, Make Room is a 1966 science fiction novel written by Henry Harrison exploring the consequences of unchecked population growth on society. It was one of the first mainstream commercial fiction books to address overpopulation concerns. The book is also famous for inspiring the 1973 film Soylent Green in which population growth triggers an alarming solution to food shortages. In the story, a gangster is murdered during a blistering Manhattan heatwave, and city cop Andy Roosh is under pressure to solve the crime. While overpopulation is a clear concern in some areas of the globe, it is an area of debate. The organisation Overpopulation Project says the world is overpopulated for two reasons. Because people are displacing wildlife species around the globe, and because we are degrading ecosystems that provide essential, irreplaceable environmental services that future generations will need to live decent lives. According to a report by Sustainable Review, there are indications why overpopulation is a myth, including the fact that in 2021 China and the US saw its first population decline in 60 years, and every region on Earth except Africa now expects more deaths than births in the coming decades. On the same environmental trend, resource scarcity is another topic sci-fi writers often grapple with when delving into sociological elements of science fiction. In the 1994 novel, Heavy Weather by Bruce Sterling, the story chronicles the adventures of a group of storm chasers in the year 2031. Global warming is ravaging the planet and spinning off hugely destructive storm systems that lay waste to populated areas. The book has a number of relevant details warning of resource wars, species collapse and deadly new disease vectors. He made the following predictions for what the world might look like in the year 2000. During the next 50 years, mankind will face three great problems. The problem of avoiding war, the problem of feeding and clothing a population of two and a quarter billions, which by 2000 will have grown upward of three billions, and the problem of supplying these billions without ruining the planet's irreplaceable resources. In 2022, Earth Overshoot Day fell on the 28th of July, a date that occurs each year and marks when humanity has used all the biological resources that Earth regenerates during that entire year. Earth Overshoot Day is computed by dividing the amount of ecological resources Earth is able to generate that year by humanity's demand for that year and multiplying it by 365, the number of days in a year. Speaking of disease vectors, the 1982 manga series Akira by Katsuhiro Otomo contains a strangely specific prediction that the 2020 Olympics are held in Tokyo during an epidemic while protesters call for it to be cancelled. In real life, the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo were postponed until 2021 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2020, theories that this manga and its 1988 film adaptation predicted the COVID-19 epidemic were exaggerated as references to epidemics are not central to the plot, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Also in the novella, The Machine Stops, published in 1909, E.M. Forster came very close to predicting the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown life in 2020. The story describes a world where most of the human population has lost the ability to live on the surface of Earth. Each individual now lives in isolation below ground in a standard room, with all bodily and spiritual needs met by the omnipotent global machine. Travel is permitted but is unpopular and rarely necessary. Communication is made via a kind of instant messaging slash video conferencing machine. Life, although it may only be an accumulation of anguish, is dear to me and I will defend it. It could be argued that little makes an impact to a society the way medical advancements do. Think back to before penicillin, antibiotics, vaccines, surgery, the list goes on. 
so it's only right that science fiction writers speculate on how advancements of the future will impact health and society. Organ transplants were one such advancement that was thought up in one of the earliest science fiction novels, Mary Shelley's The Modern Prometheus, or Frankenstein. The story is told by an English explorer in the Arctic who assists Victor Frankenstein on the final leg of his chase at the end of the novel. Frankenstein is a talented young medical student who strikes upon the secret of conquering death. In Shelley's world, she thought up a science that could reverse death with the help of organ transplants. Dr. Frankenstein reanimates dead tissue with electricity after sewing it together. And while that may be quite far out, even for modern medical practices, the foresight did imagine organ transplants more than 100 years before they ever happened. In 1954, the kidney was the first human organ to be transplanted successfully. Liver, heart and pancreas transplants were successfully performed by the late 1960s, while lung and intestinal organ transplants procedures began in the 1980s. Martin Caden's 1972 novel Cyborg predicted the first bionic limb. The novel follows former astronaut turned pilot Steve Austin who crashes during a flight, leaving him with only one limb and blind in one eye. A team of scientists gives Austin new legs, removable eye with a camera and a bionic arm which makes him a cyborg or a mixture of man and machine. The book prophesied the first bionic leg transplant by 41 years. In 1942, sci-fi giant Robert Heinlein published a short story entitled Waldo. It chronicles the journey of a mechanical genius who overcomes his skeletal muscle disease by inventing a device called Waldo F. Jones' Synchronous Reduplicating Pantograph. It lets him control a much larger remote mechanical arm simply by moving his hand and fingers. In recognition of Heinlein's idea, real-life remote manipulators have become popularly known as Waldos. A company called The Character Shop later trademarked the word Waldo for their data capture input devices that they use to control their puppets and animatronics. While advancements in genetic engineering are currently still in their infant stages, with gene editing technology such as CRISPR continuing to emerge, genetic engineering is here and will only see further advancements in the near future, bringing with it a whole host of ethical and moral conundrums that humanity will have to face. The 1896 H.G. Wells novel The Island of Dr. Moreau follows Edward Prendick, who is a shipwrecked man rescued by a passing boat. He is left on the island home of Dr. Moreau, a mad scientist who creates human-like hybrid beings from animals via vivisection. The novel deals with several philosophical themes, including moral responsibility, human identity and human interference with nature. Wells describes it as an exercise in youthful blasphemy, but is in fact a prophetic future take on genetic engineering. Another writer of classic science fiction, Aldous Huxley, thought up a society where the inhabitants were all hooked on a euphoria-inducing drug called Soma, which today could be compared to antidepressants, painkillers and tranquilizers. Huxley foreshadowed the antidepressant in his novel Brave New World, published in 1932. In modern medicine, antidepressants were not considered or studied until 1950. In the book, Soma raises an impenetrable war between the real world and the mind of its users. Today, according to the Pharmaceutical Journal, the number of antidepressants prescribed in England over the past six years has increased by almost 35%, and in the US, one in eight Americans are on them right now, according to BigThink.com. The study notes this doesn't include the large number of tranquilizers, anti-anxiety medications, or those who self-medicate with alcohol or legal marijuana. The UK's Royal College of Psychiatrists said, there are complex reasons why prescriptions for antidepressants are rising, which include progress on diagnosis and support for people with depression, changes in dosages, and the range of conditions they are prescribed for. Huxley's dystopia is especially terrifying in that the enslaved population absolutely loves their slavery and through eugenics are born into a rigid caste system. Eugenics is the study of manipulating reproduction within a human population toward a particular outcome. Today, prenatal screening has created the ability for many parents to decide if they wish to carry a disabled fetus to term or not. In Iceland, this has resulted in the near eradication of new cases of Down syndrome in the country. Almost 100% of detected cases lead to an abortion shortly after, according to the same 
Big Think article. Less well known is the process of sperm sorting, which allows for a couple to increase the chances of choosing the gender of their child as part of the process of in vitro fertilization, as well as used to prevent X-linked diseases. So now we've come to the end of this two part series. And while we've certainly covered a lot, I'm sure there are many more instances of sci-fi predicting reality out there. So let me know in the comments if you find any. Before I go, I just want to leave you with this thought. Did all of the books we've covered make predictions or did they actually inspire? And if that is the case, what is today's science fiction predicting or inspiring for tomorrow's future? Until next time, guys, happy reading.